And welcome back to our global virtual summit, Yelfin Innovate. I hope you enjoy Brad and Ned's uh, enjoyable session on some of the new developer features uh, for Yelfin 9, especially code mode and action buttons. A lot of goodies over there for our developers and analysts. Um, but if you're just joining us, I'm Ivan Siao from Yellowfin, uh, your host for today's expert panel. Uh, I'm very pleased to have a few industry experts joining us today, dialing in from various parts of the world, as you can see, uh, which is probably why you see uh, very different lights and, and weather backgrounds. Um, but we're going to talk about a pretty contentious topic today, uh, which is the ugly truth has innovation in business intelligence really stopped. Now, again, super tough to have three experts you can see dialing in and share with us their insights uh, on this topic and more and what they've been seeing out there in analytics. Um, and certainly a lot of things are changing in this industry, as you've seen from, uh, from Glenn's keynote. Um, but today we have Jen Underwood, you know, VP Product Management from ABLE, uh, Donald Farmer, Principal of Prehive Strategy, and John Sander Ferraro, Research Director uh, for Analytics, BI, and Data Management from EMA Research. Now, I'd like to start with some of the points from today's keynote, but before we do that, uh, why don't each of you tell um, you know, some of the listeners just joining us in this session a little bit about yourself and your analytics journey uh, in this industry. Uh, let's start with you, Jen. So my name is Jen Underwood. I've been in the industry now for 23 years, almost 24 years. Started for the first 15 years as an implementer in the systems uh, space, building data warehouses and data pipelines and reporting systems and trying to get people to adopt uh, predictive analytics. Then I went to the vendor side of our business and I've been there for, uh, you know, maybe the past eight years or so. Uh, and Donald? Um, yeah, I've been in the industry for a long time, nearly always working in vendors, worked with Microsoft, worked with Clake, worked with um, all sorts of you know, startups as well. And mm -hmm. I'm independent and I advise investors and vendors and um, enterprises on data and analytics strategy. Cool. Very cool. And uh, John? John Santaferraro, the head of research for data and analytics at EMA, and I've been in the industry for 25 years. I uh, started a small data warehouse company with a couple other guys back in 95. I've done a bunch of other things on the vendor side, and uh, uh, most recently also spent a couple of years building out uh, an application, an analytic application from the ground up for the $565 billion event industry. It was something that hadn't been done, so I've got a little bit of experience uh, on just about every side of this industry. Wow, wow. And you can see what a time span all three of you have been on, right? So uh, obviously don't have quite as many of the years that you, you guys have, but uh, you know, for the listeners out there, um, I've been focused on uh, business intelligence and analytics uh, with Yellowfin uh, and data warehousing as well uh, in a, quite a few roles. So initially starting off developing the software uh, that you see today, uh, and then helping our clients through uh, best practice implementation and go-to-market strategy through consulting, and then ultimately now selling the dream, uh, the BI dream through uh, product marketing. So again, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and um, if before anything else, I think before we even go to some of the points in the keynote, I think it's important to set the scene for our listeners out there in terms of the, the history of analytics. So again, um, you know, Donald, I think I'll throw, throw this out to you, you know, in terms of the global state of analytics, uh, people like to describe it as the three ways of BI. Um, and you know, for the benefit of people listening, can you sort of go into you know, where we came from and, and uh, you know, where we are at now in terms of analytics? Yeah, I think the, um, I often say that in many ways the industry has moved very far and in some ways it hasn't moved at all. Uh, when we started, we, we used to talk about this industry as being decision support, not, not oh, yeah. business intelligence. And it's a much better name because it actually tells you what the software does. It supports you in making decisions. And then you have all these terms like BI and, you know, data discovery and things which are marketing terms. But ultimately, we're still supporting people making decisions. And probably the most critical um, discovery that was made in our industry was actually quite some time ago, back in the 80s, when people started to understand that you couldn't just report over operational systems you had to build specialized analytic systems. 
in order to do analysis. That operational databases simply weren't um, optimized, um, both in terms of their design and storage for analytic processes. So the really critical thing um, that emerged from that was this idea of analytics and analysis as a separate discipline from you know, database management and, and operational processing. And then from that it developed, um, I think in the 90s, you could say that uh, the concept of business intelligence developed, which was really this idea that now, now that we've got a special analytic platform, now we can have a set of tools which are optimized for that platform. And they're not reporting tools, there are tools which actually allow a deeper level of analysis um, than just seeing a report. A report is just a definition of what, you know, what we know you want to see. There's a very clear hypothesis behind a report. Business intelligence is more about you know, answering the next question that you don't know. And so tools emerge to do that, and then ultimately tools emerge to enable business users to do that themselves without um, IT necessarily kind of doing all the, 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 the heavy lifting. And so you had the, the world of kind of self-service business intelligence developed. And, and, and that's really where we've kind of got to today. Um, and we've, we've been through these different phases of analytic systems, decision support systems, business intelligence, self-service business intelligence. And I think a lot of this conversation is about this, this point that uh, we are now at, where we're ready for what's next. And we need to see where that's going to come from. Nice. Well, I think that that's a really great, you know, just a description of, you know, the, the ways over here. But, you know, again, I'll throw this out to you, Jen. Is there anything you want to add in terms of where we're at today uh, in the state of analytics? Well, what's interesting is as I think about where we've been and we would have different organizations and different functionalities in an organization. Now I'm seeing a lot of overlap. So we'll have overlap of data science now coming into the BI tools or data prep being automated and it's kind of blending into the solutions and uh, a lot of a lot of things overlapping and, and merging together. So it's this great you know, emergence, both automation driven to some degree, but also maturity curve driven of you know, get to the next step or let's take it to the next phase. So I'm just seeing a lot of chaos with, with uh, yeah, just these these different what used to be segments of the market overlapping with each other. So, is is that overlapping and that segmentation I think good for industry vendors and customers, or is that something that is just something that we need to work through uh, as an organization who's buying this sort of software? So, so one of the things that I'm seeing is you know uh, let's pick on data catalogs for a second, and so everybody has a data catalog of sort. Now there's AI catalogs and ML catalogs and you know, data prep catalogs and catalogs for catalogs. Uh, so there, on some level, it's a matter of, you know, you'll have best-in-class solutions or you'll have a niche solution that really services your need very well. I mean, you just need to sort through some of these decisions. And on other, other things, you'll, you'll just have to sort, you know, essentially figure out what it is that you need. And you might just have, you know, the base solution that you need, cradle to grave, all the way from everything, just in a base platform. Right. So there's a bit more sorting through of, of what you really need, I think, right now. I think that's a really great point. I mean, I mean, the the fact that automation is you know truly entering and you know I, I would say quite pervasive in the industry right now, but it does also sort of bring a whole new set of problems and challenges as well, I guess. Now, um, just tr throwing this out to you now, John. You know, in your latest research for you know automation. Uh, in you know in artificial intelligence and machine learning in business intelligence, you know that research talks a little bit about, about automation and what it brings to the analytics industry. Now, can you just go a little bit into that? Yeah. So, uh, our perspective at EMA, as we looked at the business intelligence market, is that there has been stagnation over the over the last ten or twelve years, and in fact, the barrier to entry for new business intelligence companies has been fairly low. And as a result of that, we ended up with close to 100 different business intelligence reporting analytics types of companies that are all very similar to each other. And so um, our point of view and what our research showed is that the, the, the next great innovation in this space is going to be around the use of machine learning to be able to automate some of the some of the manual tasks that have been traditionally done by data analysts in the in in the BI space. 
Uh, and so, so this area of automation, in fact, is there's a very short list of companies that are doing, that are using machine learning in their analytics and business intelligence platforms to be able to automate these repetitive tasks and to be able to, to not only speed the delivery of insight to the end user, but also to be able to uh, extend the reach of BI programs so that more parts of the business can actually use it. So it's uh, so that the, this idea of automation is is very important, and it's our belief that the vendors, uh, the the BI vendors who are the first to market with a strong focus on automation are going to be the winners in the next uh, in the next five and ten years in this in this area of the marketplace. I think there's just a really good explanation in terms of automation and. For the listeners out there uh, who don't know, uh, Yellowfin has a very good uh, automated analytics product. Uh, just a little bit of a plug over there. Um, but again, so I think let's just go into then what a lot of people call augmented intelligence or augmented analytics or BI 3.0. So, so what does that look like for us uh, today? And I'll, I'll pose that to you, Don. I'm rather cynical about augmented analytics or augmented intelligence. Uh, mainly because it's companies who want to say they're doing AI, but they're not actually doing artificial intelligence, but they'd love to use the acronym. So augmented intelligence makes them sound smart. Um, but I think there's actually a fundamental problem with augmented intelligence when it comes to what a lot of um, companies are doing, which is vendors are looking at augmented intelligence as how can they use um, automation and machine learning, automated machine learning, in order to give insights to business users that business users can then drill into. So in a sense, they see it as augmenting the business user, which is fine. That's a, an incremental improvement over existing business intelligence capabilities. But I'm actually, I, I don't think innovation is incremental. I think innovation should be more radical. Call something genuinely innovative as opposed to just kind of incremental improvements. And so what I'm looking for from augmented intelligence is something which is quite the other way around where the system is capable of making decisions automatically, where the system is capable of, of managing many of the functions which are currently managed by human beings. A human beings augment the system with their intelligence. It's not machine intelligence augmenting humans, it's human intelligence augmenting machines, which are largely capable of executing many of the mundane functions on their own. And I think, um, to my mind, that's a much more interesting scenario. Because there's all the things which human beings can do, which machines simply aren't capable of. Um, and those are very human subject areas. There are areas such as empathy and compassion and understanding and um, being able to be radical, um, being able to kind of, uh, the, the, the classic phrase is thinking outside the box, but the great thing about human beings is we don't even need to have a box. We, we can think in ways which are dramatically different from the uh, processes which machines use. So I don't think of augmented intelligence as being very interesting, but it's just machine intelligence augmenting humans. I want to see it the other way again, automated systems where human beings are bringing their intelligence to bear. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good point. I mean, before we even have that little step change, you know, that whole transformational value that sort of gets created in a bang, um, you know, with a really big innovation, I think some of the quicker wins and some, some of the things that make perhaps a little bit more sense is having those Again, I don't like calling it AI because it's not really AI. We'll call it machine-assisted algorithms, helping humans to make uh, you know, better decisions and really automating a lot of the tasks that consume so much of their time today uh, and actually help support them in decision-making. So decision support, you know, love that term. Um, now, just looking back into, again, speaking gears into Glenn's keynote earlier, um, and he was actually talking about this in terms of, uh, let me just refer back to my notes here, that 92% of organizations reported that the big data and AI investments are actually accelerating, but yet 69% of organizations have not yet created a data-driven organization. Uh, in fact, 72% have yet to forge a data culture at all, and one in two organizations aren't treating data as a business asset or admitting they aren't actually competing on data and analytics at all. So again, I'll just throw this to you, uh, Jen. Do you think there's a disconnect here? Yeah, I've seen that a lot. So even in the automated machine learning space, 85% of uh, projects fail, according to one of Gartner's recent studies. And I thought that was fairly shocking because 
the barriers have been reduced uh, tremendously, although they still exist. And to Donald's point, you know, we've been focused on the machines, but we have forgotten that the business needs to solve problems. So we still have technical, and this is the same problem that we had, you know, 25 years ago. The bit, you know, you have a bunch of technical people and they're in their silo, but the business needs to get answers here and now, and they just need to get it done. Um, so what, what's interesting is this disconnect continues and we're starting to see the same patterns, you know, 20, 20 years later, in fact. But it, it is, I, I think the one thing I have seen that's a bright spot is folks realizing we're living in a digital competitive era that data and you know, making data driven decisions and automating some of these processes will define who wins and loses in this next era. So the processes and customer experience being digital really changes the game. People are competing on algorithms. We, we have different you know, ways that different organizations will compete now with the algorithm advantage of just using you know, what's profitable or unprofitable or who do I focus my time and limited resources. And the groups that are getting that, I saw a fantastic study by McKinsey saying you know, the, the cash and the, and the ROI that they're bringing to their organization is fairly staggering versus laggards in the same um, industry segment. So the opportunities there, uh, culturally, we've been very challenged to to you know be open to change and to be open to rethinking processes, apply design thinking, and and just in you know invent something new and better. I think that's a really really big point. I think the the opportunity for innovation is there. The, the opportunity for the business to actually transform itself with this new set of technologies is there as well. Um, but. You know, as, as we sort of go back to the baseline of how the industry waves came about, you know, BI 1, 2, and 3.0, um, I think, you know, you've seen and heard all of these before, you know, everyone on the call about, uh, you know, in BI 2.0, where it was the golden era of visual self-service analytics, and it was sort of sold to be, you know, the solution and the, the um, you know, the thing that would solve all of this. So do you think organizations are now kind of like, uh, you know, bitten and a little bit shy in adopting automation and AI and ML, or or is is there you know something that's uh, you know that needs to change over here? And I'll throw that to you, uh, John. Yeah, I, I would say yes. There's a there's both the hype, and because of the hype, companies are jumping into the AI market, which is really more machine learning. Um, but but there's also there, there also is some hesitancy because people, there's a lot of confusion. People don't even know what type of artificial intelligence or what type of machine learning to be able to use to solve real business challenges and specifically their own challenges. And so when they look at the, the broad range of products that are out there, uh, it's, it's, it's very confusing. It's very difficult for the marketplace to, to really understand that. Where we are seeing, uh, where we are seeing real adoption is in the use of machine learning that is embedded in the business intelligence tools, in the, the data management tools, in the data integration tools, data prep tools, catalogs, because people, because the uh, people are recognizing that those, those items in the, the analytics and data management tool, driving things towards a insight driven organization. In fact, the recent research that we did, um, we asked the question, what cultural changes are you seeing in your organization as a result of the use of machine learning in your data and analytics tools? And the, the top four answers are all driving towards uh, be, becoming an insight-driven organization. Uh, number one, more people are making insight-driven decisions. Number two, more people are using data. Number three, more people are sharing data and insights. And number four, more people are asking for data. So, so um, the, the use of machine learning in a BI tool or in a data management tool is actually driving things more quickly towards becoming insight-driven organizations. That's a really good point. You know, in terms of you know, insight-driven organization now, there are a lot of tools out there, and there's a lot of technology out there. You know, both uh, you know at the early stages and a little bit mature in what we call, you know, augmented intelligence or you know BI 3.0. Now, let's let's maybe center it a little bit for the listeners out there who might be on this journey the first time, or they're thinking of you know getting their feet wet. 
So let's go into what maybe some all of you, you know, like what do you guys think is truly innovative for this time in today's uh, state of analytics? And I'll, I'll pose that to you, Jen. Oh, so what I'm seeing right now that's really innovative when you start thinking about it is is end-to-end -end solution integration the, where the system, and you talked about insights and apps and, and that whole process from knowing the source system, preparing the data automatically, you know, generating a base set of reports or a, a great base set of insights, tracking the system automatically to, to alert you. And that's something that Yellowfin's done for a while that I really liked was the proactive alerting and the trend checking and just making it very easy to understand why and what to do next with the information, um, you know, optimizing a, a situation per se. But this whole concept of looking at where all the pain happens across the whole life cycle, that's where it's really getting beautiful and fun is just seeing a lot of the, the tedious work that's been automated. Now you can really just look and apply your business domain knowledge to understand what's happening. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's just so much time savings that can be realized, especially we just if you just automate the tasks that are currently manual. Now, I'll throw this to you, Donald, as well. On you know, in your travels, what do you actually see uh, that's truly innovative uh, right now? I think the, one of the things that's, that's really changing in the industry, and I'm, I'm enjoying seeing these innovations, is um, we're breaking away from the idea that there's one way in which to represent data, that it has to be in a visualization, or it has to be in a dashboard, or it has to be in a report. And instead, what I'm seeing is a lot of innovation in the ways in which data can be, and, and insights can be delivered to people. I think actually Glenn has made this point many times that uh, you know mobile business intelligence largely failed because people tried to put a dashboard on a phone. And that's completely, yeah. wrong. It's, it's, it's the wrong format for the dashboard, and it's the wrong way of giving information on a phone. And I'm seeing um, an acknowledgement of that, um, Yellowfin in particular, but other companies are doing this as well, of, of how do you actually deliver data in the right format? Are in the right context for people, and I'm seeing this in you know analytic applications. I'm seeing it in, in BI applications. I'm seeing it also in operational applications where people are, as John was saying, embedding intelligence into into systems. And so I think um, this realization that user experience is not about how you make an existing experience consumable by a user, but how you meet a user where they are and mm -hmm. develop an experience which is very empathetic to that user's needs at the point where they are using it. Rather than expecting them to come to you and learn your system, um, we can go to them with um, format and content which is appropriate for what they're doing. And you see this in the growth of storytelling, you see it in the growth of natural language interfaces, you see it in the growth of this new generation of mobile. And I think all that's pretty interesting. I think that's a really good point. You know, in terms of you know really thinking about the experiences uh, of you know different kinds of users and how they actually consume data, which might be more than one way. Uh, and as I think I like this phrase that someone um, you know talked about, and I can't quite remember who it is, but um, someone said you know vendors have been preoccupied with selling golf clubs to everyone, you know, expecting everyone to play golf. Um, but what if you know people don't want to play golf? You know, what about those kind of people? Um, now I'll just throw this back to you, John, just to throw round us off on this cat in this category. Um, you know, what's truly innovative that you've seen uh, in your travel? Yeah, it's interesting because um, it was 20 years ago that we began talking about this idea of closed loop analytics, right? Mm -hmm. And we had to talk about it in that way 20 years ago because uh, because the application was very separate from the analytics, and and it was a it was a major heavy lifting task to be able to get, you know, some insight that was gained to the person who actually needs to use it on the front lines. And I think that, you know, the, the, the BI vendors, um, a lot of what you've done at Yellowfin, for example, have are you're ahead of the game because you've created a web uh, application that is that is embeddable in any kind of other application. Um, so that you can have BI right there present in an application. I think that's really powerful. Um, you have all the story ca telling capabilities to be able to, to bring uh, to life the data to the person who needs to make the decision. The, the lag has been on the back end. Uh, databases have not been able to, to handle these intelligent, smart applications where you have the insights embedded right in the application for the person who uses it. And I'm beginning to see innovation now where 
Um, there are new database vendors uh, and some of the in-memory database vendors that now have the kind of backend platform uh, that along with streaming data that's going to push everything finally into extremely intelligent applications. And so, so I, think, I think that's where the innovation is going to happen. The other thing that I'm seeing is um, so, some real uh, smarts around business first. Um, yeah. To not just, for example, automate something or use the best algorithm, uh, but to look first at business constraints and to look first at, uh, you know, exactly, you know, how big is my sales force? Um, to be able to to look at constraints that might be in supply chain, and then to get the best algorithm for the business, not necessarily just the most accurate algorithm. I think that's uh, that's uh, uh, definitely on the front lines there. Yeah, I think there's some several good points there, especially being business first. I think that's ultimately what I think organizations who are listening to this session here today uh, should take away from, you know, in terms of before going away and choosing what they think is a perfect algorithm, think first about your business use case before, uh, you know, embarking on that journey. Now, as we know, you know, technology can't be the only pillar to move this forward. And when I say move this forward, it is just the innovation experience and actually realizing the promise uh, for uh, you know, this, uh, business or what I'll call the business. So let's switch gears now and actually talk about another point, which I feel is a little bit underappreciated, uh, which affects analytics adoption. And that's the, the analytics experience. Um, just to sort of define this a little bit for the people listening on the call, you know, when people talk about the analytics experience, it's very easy to lump it all into one experience, which people just call the user experience. Um, but there's obviously, you know, in my opinion, a creation aspect to it and also a consumption aspect to it, uh, which services different kinds of user types and groups. Uh, also, depending on what sort of device you're on and what sort of experience a person ex is expecting when engaging that so let's tackle the uh, you know the analytics experience for data consumption first now Donald I'll throw this one to you uh, because in terms of data consumption and sense making in BI uh, you know naturally there is some sort of behavioral science there uh, and in your recent articles you refer to this as the four stages of browsing and discovery so for our listeners who have not heard about this before can you go into a little bit of detail into what that is sure um, so uh the concept that I use of the four stages of, of, of browsing or exploring data actually comes from library science. Uh, library science had the original um, big data problem, which uh, came with microfilm and microfiche. They had far too much um, information for people to handle, and um, how, how do you ever discover anything in that in that system? And so, in the old days, um, libraries had catalogs, which were very like a query system. You went in and asked, and you got an answer. Um, but a browsing experience is very different, and you can actually take this model and apply it very practically to analytic systems um, as well. And the four stages are pretty simple. The first stage is orientation. You need to know where you are and what you're looking at and where you can go. You need to have an overview of, of you know, am I, what data am I looking at? Where did it come from? What are, what are the capabilities I have with this data? So you have to be able to orient yourself in the system. The second thing is that you have to be able to glimpse and we often overlook this, this, this uh, phase, but it's very, very important. How do I notice something that's interesting? How do I notice something that's changed? How do I notice something that's important to me? Uh, without having to drill into it in, in, in detail, I just need to be able to glimpse what's important. And sometimes that's easier if it's an outlier, for example. Sometimes it's more complex if the data is um, data that you see very often and, and, and there aren't major changes in it. And so when you're working on that part of the experience, how do you make it glimpseable? Having glimpsed something, you then want to examine it in more detail. Well, this is interesting. Why is it interesting? What is behind these numbers? And that can involve kind of drilling down, drilling through, and so on. And um, again, that's part of the experience which, which we should spend a lot of time on. And then the final part of the experience, which is often overlooked, is, well, what do I do with it? Um, mm -hmm. Having oriented yourself, having glimpsed something interesting, having examined it, well, now what do I do? And I would say 90% of business intelligence tools drop the ball at that point. They just don't want to care about that. What do you do with it? Well, that's up to you. Are you going to send an email? Are you going to um, take an action? Are you going to tell a story? Are you going to make a presentation? What are you going to do with this insight that you've got? And that's something which um, it's super interesting to me in different ways that you can put that up and say, I've made an insight. Now I need to, to take an action, acquire it and take an action. So those are the four stages, um, orientation, 
glimpsing, examining, and then acquiring and taking an action. Thanks, thanks for that. I think that's, that's a really great explanation on that model. And I think if you really look into it deeply then start breaking it down, I think that's one of the things that you know, we at Yellowfin really sort of follow and think about. Um, you know, just using an, an early example of our, you know, our new mobile app release where we started thinking about desktop modes versus mobile modes. Uh, and you know, if you're looking at Yellowfin the first time, crazy thing, our mobile app has no dashboards whatsoever. Uh, which was a huge shock for a lot of people uh, who were expecting it because they've seen it in other BI vendor apps as well. Um, and I think we actually subscribe to that 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 notion that you know that the the immersion and chunking of doing stuff. You know, once you you've, you've gotten the insight and you want to do a little bit more and you know deep uh, analysis, then that's more suited to, uh, towards the desktop. Um, but if you're more like snacking or glimpsing, then that's better for a mobile app where you're just looking for you know outliers and changes and then you know going uh, away with it. Um, so we kind of think that there are unique experiences which naturally come out of the various stages that sort of Donald talked about um, across uh, devices as well. Now, it's it's pretty interesting because it makes so much sense, but yet you don't see a lot of vendors actually thinking about this uh, or actually using that as a driver for innovation um, for the different kinds of users who expect this. Now, I'll throw this to you, John. Now, um, do you think it's, uh, you know, that most vendors are actually getting this right today in terms of innovating for that sort of experience? Uh, I think there's, I think there's a lot of work to still be done uh, from all vendors, to be honest with you, because, because the, uh, th this is the, one of the frontiers that we have not yet uh, really explored and done well is determining uh, a way to get context to the individual user. So most, most users experience within a business intelligence tool uh, is still too crowded. There's too much. And uh, it's, it's difficult for them to find information that is relevant to their particular slice of work. And so I, I think we, I think we still have a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, I do believe that this is an area where machine learning can really help as, uh, as, as business intelligence vendors begin to look uh, at their metadata and better understand, um, you know, where, what data has this person looked at, where, uh, how have they scored uh, particular dashboards or uh, portions of insight that they've, they've looked at, um, the, the augmented intelligence that has been delivered to them was it relevant to them or not mm -hmm. uh, as this as as we continue to capture metadata around the use of individual users i i think that we're that's where that's where the real breakthrough in analytic experience is going to take place yeah i think it's some really great points there in terms of referencing i think what vendors like to call personalization and relevance now jen i'll, I'll throw this to you do you think there's a lot more work to be done around personalization and, and you know, and relevant of augmented intelligence and insights, or should people start thinking about automating most parts or other parts of the system? Because I know you've done a lot of work uh, recently with auto machine learning. So what do you think are the key drivers for, for innovation here? So I think one of the key points that was made was understanding the context and what to do next with the information. And that is a massive gap. The ability for the application, you know, partnerships in your organization, maybe whether it's SAP or Oracle, you have all these different applications, workforce. There's there's a ton of different apps that people are using, Marketo. If you can understand what folks are going to do with that information, you can create different actions and paths within the BI solutions to connect these two worlds together to really blend those experiences better. So not just getting the so what, but understanding now what, and this is the recommended action, you can you can unify them. Some of this is really just getting a bit more um, in depth with the applications and the user process. Mm -hmm. And and the other part is is just, you know, this is is talking more with, with the business. I think we we forget that you know, yeah, we, we have, have this information, but we don't know how it's used. And that's a, you know, that was something back 20 years ago, looking and building reporting systems, looking, even physically looking at the process and saying, well, what can we do better? I think a lot of people skip over that. They, they, they're in the digital world. It's easy to sit remotely at your desk and just look at the data. But you've never gotten off and met with that person or looked at the process and looked at, well, 
what what could we do or what's the art of the possible in this situation we, we feel it, that, that that one developing that's actually really interesting. So let's let's just drill a little bit into that. I think it, it there's a few points uh, you know embedded there where it's almost vendors have been I would almost say in my opinion obsessed with insight discovery, but not really understanding the process that happens after that. Um, you know, not really thinking as insight discovery as the start of a process, but rather than the end. Um, and I think you know for for many people that's perhaps one of the ways why analytics is still uh, what we call a one way communications tool right so in a pursuit of insight discovery so what then what what do i do next do i, mm -hmm. do I send an email do i log into a different system why do i need to log into a different system in the first place i think vendors probably have not thought about that that seamless workflow or even bringing that workflow uh, into the bi system uh, as well so if if that's the thing then I think let's just introduce the fact that you know in, in terms of embedded bi the the reversal embedded bi and i don't really have a good term for it i think for us analytical <laughs> translatical uh you know apps uh, where people are actually thinking about bringing you know data entry and transaction processing functionalities and process workflows into the bi application rather than bringing the bi stuff into other apps which is what we know as embedded bi so how, how transformational would that be um, do you think? Oh, I think it'd be magical, quite frankly. It'd be, it'd be really interesting. And we're, I've seen this a few times and I've had requirements, you know, in, in the past to do what we call write back. So uh, John had mentioned the whole concept of the loop and the, and the closed loop systems of you getting the information and writing back and then improving the, the outputs. And Donald had mentioned human guided. That really brings it all together if you can do that. Yeah, yeah. Now, Donald, you, you kind of seem like you have a, an opinion on this, so I'm going to throw it out to you. Um, do you think actions are the way to go, you know, in terms of bringing workflows into BI, or is that something that's completely untapped and I'm not really thought about? I think I think they can work, but but there's a, a constraint on this, which is the um, the ability of the organization to actually live with the actions. Um, you know, we we speak a lot in the BI world just now about data literacy. And we tend to think about data literacy as about the, the, the literacy of an individual. But actually, if you don't have a data literate organization, then no matter what comes out of your BI system, whether it's analytics or whether it's an action, if the, if the organization is not able to act on that, is not able to absorb the action or is not able to respond to the action, then it becomes a wasted effort. And that's a, that, that's a real challenge, I think. It's actually not building the technology that can take these actions or building the technology that can advise on these actions. It's building the organization that's ready to live with that technology. And most aren't. I spent a lot of my time. Yeah, sitting true. Sure. Um, you know, I, I like to go and sit in quarterly sales meetings, for example, and sit and, and just observe. I don't take part, I just observe and I take notes of what's happening. And they all have dashboards, they all have data. Many of them have even recommended actions that come out of that. But all the decisions are taken by human beings who are not even looking at the screen. They're, they're, they're talking about all sorts of things which aren't even part of the data. They're talking about macroeconomic conditions, they're talking about salespeople's personal lives and pressures they're under, and they're talking about you know what happened at the various customers, none of which are captured in the data that they're making decisions with. So I worry that organizations they might talk the talk, but they're not ready to walk the walk when it comes to actions. I think mm -hmm. they're a great concept, but I think organizational maturity has to be there to take advantage of. It, you know, like there's yeah. a, Go ahead. Uh, there, I think there's a real opportunity for uh, business intelligence vendors to, to begin to look at actual decision science. Yeah. Uh, and oh, what, I, what I mean by that is there are human factors when when uh, everybody carries data into the boardroom and in the boardroom decisions are made um, and those decisions are made by a number of different human factors. And there's a lot of science that has looked in, in, in into this idea of how do people make decisions, but nobody has has actually operationalized that. So that so that there is in an application like a BI tool where you have the data you bring the data into the boardroom, the decisions are actually made in that environment. You have, uh, you actually know what data was presented in that board meeting 
and you know who voted for what and what decision was made in that particular boardroom, and now you have it, it's auditable. And then, because there's, there's also buyer's remorse, right? Because these decisions are made, and then a month later, one of the executives comes back and says, well, I didn't, you know, I wasn't for that, or, you know, why did we, why did we do that anyway? Nobody knows, because it happened in, in that closed room. And so there's an opportunity, I think, for business intelligence vendors to actually um, extend their systems to, to incorporate some of that decision science and auditability and accountability around decisions that are made. You've realized what you've just done there, John, have you? I'm going to save this decision science as a marketing speak for my little fold over here, and I'm going to completely over you in my board. <laughs> the next few, so watch out for that. Um, and I'm sure other BI vendors will be jumping on board right now as well in their marketing teams. So again, I think there's some really great stuff there you know, in terms of what we expect out of technology vendors. But ultimately, I think we can all agree that you know the analytics experience here ultimately builds uh, an organizational culture uh, around analytics. And you know, I think people constantly refer to this as data-driven culture or insights-driven culture. Uh, and again, completely overused by marketing teams and by vendors. You know, yours truly as well, uh, but not too much, hopefully. Um, so let's let's go into that. Let's let's now think about, you know, again, just building off Donald's point that you know you could have all these things set up, but then the decision that's made in the boardroom doesn't quite, and there's a disconnect there. Um, and you know, I think we at Yellowfin here, you know, we 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 recognize this, and but we believe that organizations are ultimately far more successful when everyone engages with data, um, you know, as lofty of a goal that is. Um, and will we define engaging here as, you know, not just consuming, but sharing and acting on data as well, which is the, the goal that everyone wants to go to. So not just analysts and developers building things, but, you know, business users, which is a lot of them uh, in the boardroom, which ultimately can create and deliver that organizational value at the end. Um, now, I'll throw this back to you, Jen. Do you think vendors are actually prioritizing this when they build products, or are they actually thinking deeply about these things when building these things uh, to actually drive a true data-driven culture? So one of the things that's interesting, yes. Uh, so I will say, having been on a few different product teams now, uh, global pro to developing global product, sharing is really important, transparency, getting folks to do a job. Uh, now, probably most of the conversations that I have with groups you know, they get scared about the numbers being transparent and everyone's seeing them. And, you know, we have other groups that, you know, it's still very political. People are political and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of justifications for different things that happen. So there's some fear. The, the whole culture aspect, that is the biggest blocker in most, most groups. When you do, and I've even been in organizations that, you know, when my numbers and numbers were shown, or I've worked with other consultants when I was in consulting, and we could see who is on the bench, or we can see it does motivate humans uh, if there's some accountability somewhere for your numbers. But yeah, there's a lot of competitors are are certainly thinking and trying, and usually it's about sharing and helping people be able to understand what they're seeing and make it easier to consume. Uh, there just seems to also be that whole disconnect with, you know, I. I develop product in XYZ city or states in some country and my team doesn't get out and see what's being done. So I think, you know, so they really don't know how the product's being used. Yeah, some great points. I mean, it, it ultimately, I would even say, again, I'll throw this to you, Donald. I think besides vendors doing as much as they can to sort of drive that culture and create a culture, but I would almost say that, that the buyer needs to share the responsibility in, in creating that culture. Uh, and this is the easiest way, I think, would be from top-down leadership, right? Um, absolutely. And, um, you know, today most uh, business decisions are driven by what's sometimes called the HIPPO method, which is the highest income person's prejudiced opinion. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we have to be able to... Hey, a wide diversity of views it's actually debate and the problem you know the, the, the problem with analytics is that it, it, it should inspire debate it should inspire conversation around you know what are we actually seeing what is the explanation for what we're seeing and then the data backs that up and no matter how much data you provide no matter how many analytic tools you provide if the organization isn't prepared for debate 
and um, for conversation and for diversity of opinion, then it doesn't matter what tools or what data you throw at it, it's not going to, it's not going to make any difference. So yes, there's a certain amount of organizational data literacy which has to happen, but there also has to be a certain organizational flexibility and openness, which is also a prerequisite. Yeah, that's actually a really profound point. I mean, a lot of people, I think, think of that and even refer to, um, you know, that famous quote by the Netscape CEO, I think it was Jim Barksdale, where, you know, if we have data, you know, let's look at data. If we have all we have opinions, let's go with mine. You know, and I think the senior management will have a real great opportunity uh, to really model behaviors using data and to, to make decisions. You know, because after all, if everyone's making decisions based on their own opinions, then why should anyone else even use data to do the same uh, downstream? Exactly. Yeah, so I think that there is a key opportunity here besides technology and, and within culture to really break that mindset where opinion is more important than data. And we see this everywhere, right? I'm, I'm sure you guys have advised companies who apparently want a solution, but when you come and talk to them, you know, that that opinion ultimately prevails. So I'll throw this to you, John. You know, now this is quite a bumpy ride for an organization to go through to build data-driven culture. But you know, what have you figured out you know, in, in your uh, advisory panels or you know, your work um, around the things that organizations uh, you know, need to do to drive data-driven culture? You know, I think it's important to drive, uh, to become a, an insight-driven organization. But ultimately, you want to become an insight-driven organization so that you can create analytic value. And ultimately, I think companies need to be able to create analytic value that shows up on the books. And it, it, you, it, it, in fact, if you look at companies that, that have analytics as their banner and are seen as analytic companies, their valuation in the marketplace is going to have multipliers of, you know, sometimes 20 and 25x in terms of revenue versus somebody who might be an application company or a product company. And so all of these companies have this data. That, and I think ultimately the reason, it, it, even more important than everybody making data-driven decisions, which is never going to happen, more important, are we creating value with our analytics? And is that value demonstrable to the marketplace and to the stakeholders? And is it impacting the bottom line? Now you're now you've got something that is really tangible and that, that really matters in the marketplace. I think I think you just hit the nail on the head there. You know, amidst all of this stuff and what we'll call it chaos, ultimately it has to create value. You know, create I would almost say transformational value for organizations for it to even have some sort of lasting effect. Now, um, you know, before before we sort of round up, I think we should maybe talk a little bit about maybe, you know, we've talked about technology, we've talked about culture, we've talked about you know, the consumption experience, but one of the things that I think is, you know, perhaps one of the most important bits that hold everything up is people, people and skills. So with what we talked about earlier on, you know, in terms of the, you know, advancements in technology, you know, be it data cataloging or prep or automated insights or assistant insights, you know, and, or, or the whole workflow automation, what does it mean for analysts and developers today who perhaps need to do a little bit less or do they still need to do a little bit more you know and I'll, I'll throw this to you Jen now um, do you think in, in this workplace that the skills for analytics uh, now need to change or to be reprioritized I do think they're changing so I think there's a lot there, there should be a lot less emphasis on hey can you query data or are you able to I mean we still have that but probably one of the key things when it comes to when the systems are doing a lot more of the work is asking the right questions and solving the right problems. So it's critical thinking, it's it's confidence, it's navigating the politics and being able to find the right projects and where you can deliver value very quickly to the organization, those types of things. When I first started, it was really just a query data. I sat in the back room, people came to me. Uh, there aren't back rooms anymore where, de where developers just, you know, d decide to do a drop down list with a query. Um, you really have to integrate it into the business. And that's a different skill because you're navigating kind of the unknown. And a lot of programmers and you know, developers or coders, they're just comfortable in the black and white. And the world is so not black and white when you when you have to get out and solve problems. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if only the world was black and white, and uh, okay, coming as an ex-developer, you know, it's kind of like a one is a one, and zero is a zero. What do you mean? Is the world's gray? Um, again, again, yeah, I think, yeah. Donald, do you have any comments in terms of 
um, you know, what what analysts should perhaps chase after in, in this world of automation and maybe concentrate a little bit less on the whole, what we call the, the accidental discovery route where you're preparing data, you're sort of cleaning it, you're, you're cleansing it, then you're building more analytical objects, which everyone falls in love with a dashboard and was concentrated on that paradigm. But does automation break, break open the entire paradigm and then free these you know, people up to maybe concentrate on more things? And what important things would that be? I think the important thing they have to be able to, to, to do, which human beings can do, um, is focus on ambiguity. And it's very much kind of in line with what, what, what Jen was saying, is that you know, the, the, the world of business is ambiguous. It's not as if there are clear, well-defined decisions with clear, well-defined answers. Things would be much easier if they were. But the world is really messy. And it's human beings who can, who can do that. And analysts who've got a, a, a grasp of ambiguity, um, both technically, that is to say, they understand statistics, they understand, um, they understand the, um, the data science that's going to come out. And you'll see this a lot more. Every data science and artificial intelligence course at every university in the world is oversubscribed. So just now there are relatively few data scientists and they're very high value. In a few years, data science as a, as a a job skill will be almost commoditized, um, but they won't necessarily have a real world working experience. So they'll have a statistical understanding of ambiguity. They need to learn um, the, the real world skills of, of how business actually operates. And I think that's what we'll see, um, you know, the, the organizations develop in, in years to come of how do you bring people who've got a statistical understanding tells you that a zebra is a small gray horse, um, because on average it is. But actually, you have to be able to see the world in, you know, rather more kind of um, defined terms that have business um, knowledge and business understanding behind them. And I think that's what you'll see developing. Hmm. Interesting. So again, it's actually let's build on that point. And John, I'll throw this to you. So in terms of you know data science skills being commoditized, then would you say that the 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 other things that allow developers and analysts to be again still to be data heroes? will be to actually focus a little bit more insight interpretation and storytelling to ensure that you know the organization behind them actually understands a common and consistent you know um, picture of, the, of all the KPIs and numbers yeah I, I think that um, I'm going to take it a, a little bit of a, of a different direction because in the research we did um, we asked participants to rank five areas of value creation in the use of machine learning and business intelligence and data management tools, um, looking at what type of value is being created for your organization. And the number one answer that came back was uh, uh, innovation opportunity. They, they, the number one value of using machine learning is to be able to work on more innovative projects. Oh, yeah. And we had, we, we had a number of business users and we had a number of technical users and quite frankly, innovation is different for those two audiences. For the IT folks and for the data uh, analysts, their innovation might be working on new data projects. It might be more on the data science side. It could be storytelling. Um, it, it could be any of those things. It could be new types of data. Um, it could be integration of data into applications. It's any of those things for the business. They're looking at innovation as the creation of new and better or improved business models to be able to drive revenue. So innovation is, is definitely what, what people are seeing as the number one driver for the use of automation in, in BI platforms. Two, three, four, and five by, by order were time savings, money savings, resource savings, and number five was risk avoidance. So those other things are in part important, but uh, number one opportunity is innovation. Really interesting there. Yeah, I, I remember watching uh, or well, reading that report and just noticing that as, as being the number one driver was a little bit surprising, but also quite profound. Now, we're nearly running out of time here. And again, this is the bit that everyone likes. So huge journey, huge changes coming along the horizon. And if I'm an organization and listening to this panel for the first time, it's going to sound like, oh my God, you know, there's so much I need to do and then understand. So I'll throw this one out to everyone just very quickly. What's the, the quickest win that an organization can you know, latch on to right now to get themselves right, you know, in this, in this analytics journey that we just talked about? And I'll throw this one uh, to Don, Donald. 
Um, integrate your analytic systems with your current systems of collaboration, with your chat systems, your sharing systems, so that you can actually start to debate um, and have conversations around the, the, the insights that you gain. Okay, that's really good. And Jen? I'd say teach folks how uh, the concepts of design thinking and part of possible versus just accepting the information or the as is, and that's a skill to be able to kind of question and really think what could it be. That's really good design thinking. Now, John, take it away and finish us off here. Uh, I've I've already uh, sort of uh, showed my cards, right? I <laughs> I'm going to have to say automation. Um, you know, automate these these. Uh, you know, manually intensive activities that are that are just taking up all of the time of your of your data organization, and uh, the more you automate, the more bubbles up for the business to be able to use and profit. Well, there you have it, guys. One of the things you can maybe lock you know lock into if you're an organization that's looking to transform uh, you know, your organization from what you are today to what can be. Uh, with these technologies that you know all these experts talked about. Now, um, that's pretty much all the time uh, that we have today um, based on today's topic uh, in terms of innovation in business intelligence. You know, this has been really useful for me personally, and I hope that's useful for you who, uh, who's listening to this session. And clearly, there's you know quite a bit of innovation out there that's exciting uh, that can still you know solve some very big problems. Um, so again, I'd like to thank our experts for joining us here today, Jen, Donald, and John. Uh, for joining us at a global virtual summit, uh, Yelp Innovate. Just really appreciate you taking the time. Um, but, but if the listeners out there would like to continue to follow you or listen to or look at your work and research, uh, where could they do that? Well, in my case, the easiest thing is to go to my website, truehowstrategy.com. And How Jen? Mine's easy. It's my name, jenunderwood.com. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my organization. EMAUSA.com. There you go. So again, jump on your social media channels, jump on your websites, and follow Jen, Donald, and John. Uh, just a reminder that we have a Women in Data panel coming up next, hosted and moderated by Simone Clancy, our Director of People Strategy. So please stay on for this awesome session with the topic being realizing the true value of diversity in driving innovation. So some very uh, you know, exciting panel experts over there who are going to share the journey um, you know, in, in this workplace. Now, if you have any questions for us, please put them into the Q&A box. Otherwise, feel free to tag us on social media at YellowfinBI with the hashtag YFInnovate. We'll get back to you directly on your channels or directly via email uh, as well. And again, huge thanks to uh, everyone on this call, and thank you for joining us.